Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon of Magnetic Service. Words spoken for many years to the human beings in their perception of 3D. Words spoken by a human partner who at this moment is overcome with the love of God. It is the promise that I have given to humanity that for as long as there will be ears to listen, I will be here to teach. And that I am uncomfortable teaching those who know already. It is only because of the veil and the duality that I bring these things forward, things that when I touch upon them will resound within you. For there is no guruship represented here. There is no prophet speaking to you here. There is a family member who when you are not in this place called earth is your best friend. For we have made this journey, dear ones, together so often. I am known as the support group for you. And you know who I am. And when you make the transition and yet again, again, I would seemingly meet you on the other side of the veil yet again. And I would say, welcome home, brother, sister, welcome home. Job well done. And we would touch each other energetically as a human would hug a human and we would reach out and entwine the energy one with another in this embrace. And you would know me and I would know you yet again and it's almost like nothing had ever occurred since, since you left the first time. Timelessness again would be your staple the interdimensional persona of light that you are, the peace of God that you are, would come flowing back in. And you would then immediately start preparing the energy for yet another run at earth. Even if you think it's your last time, it isn't. I know this because I know the rest of the intelligence that you're not allowed to have as you sit in the chairs. I live with it. What you would call the higher self, I live with it. It is part of me and part of you. We are connected in ways that you cannot even imagine. This is not a higher source speaking to you. It is the source. It is you with you through a voice of a human being and a process that is not new called channeling. The entourage is different each time we come in. It speaks of the energy of you. No matter what the teaching is this day, no matter what is going to be said this day, there's an energy of reunion that I invite you to feel during these moments. It goes way beyond the teaching. It's me with you. It's the God source. It's part of your DNA starting to resound with sitting in the energy. Some of you are going to feel different. You'll know this is real. I tell you, dear human beings, there are those of you who would say, is this a human talking? Is this real? God, show me a sign. I'll give you the sign. Here's the sign. You sit there in belief and wait. You'll be touched. Your heart will start to resound. There will be parts of your body that may vibrate. You may find it difficult with your shoulders to move them or with your knees or your feet because we're sitting upon you. A pressure is upon you. I'm telling you, this is a private, private thing, each to his own, each in his own way. But the love of God is thick. It always has been. It is what has pressed those prophets into the earth when they stood before the angels of spirit. 
It is what has made it difficult to breathe when the interdimensional energy is so thick when God speaks to men and women. Let this never be commonplace. When you sit within yourself in your own meditations and you speak to spirit and you say, Oh God, meet me here. Tell me what it is I need to know. When you do that, feel this thickness of spirit. Take in all there is to take in. There's such a shift that is possible, human being. We invite you to dip into that veil in a way perhaps you never have before. Ask for the belief that you need. Feel the love of God in your life. Speak in ways you've never spoken. Is it casual for you? Well, if it is, you're not doing it right. Let these things resound with you so that you weep with the joy of the experience and no matter what is happening in your life, no matter what it is in 3D, let you say it is well with my soul. For I have gone and transcended beyond the troubles of earth. And I sit in a sacred place that is my place, it is the God place while I'm alive as a human being. Let that rotate around you. I say these things because of what we teach next. I haven't enough metaphors and yet I'll pull many out. <laughs> to give you what human beings need to know about seers, psychics, readers, and those prophets who would go beyond the veil and give you the future. I am not in a vacuum. I am cryon. Indeed, I am aware of your earthly time. I know what has transpired. I know this is the new year, of course. The year of the nine, and we'll speak of that in just a moment. What does it mean? What's going to happen, you say? Oh, crying, I've come today because I, I want to I hear from the lips of the channeler what's going to happen. 2007, 2008, beyond. I'm also aware these are the first channeling words that my partner has spoken in this energy that you call 2007. Unique, therefore, this meeting would be the first one of the year that crying speaks to. And yet I have to warn you about this. The human being still does not know what he asks for when he wants to know the future. It lays upon you in a biased fashion because, because you only see a linear strip of time and you want to know what's going to happen on that linear strip of time. Not only that, you're not willing to hear certain potentials. Not all of you. But I'm going to give you an example of what humanity often does to the prophet, to the psychic. When it goes to them and asks, well, tell me, What's going to happen in the future? And they sit there in anticipation. Here's the first metaphor of the day among many. Let me give it to you. There is a, a woman who goes to the doctor. And she says to the doctor, I, something's wrong with me. I don't feel well. I need you to tell me what it is that's wrong with me. And the doctor says, that's fine, give me your symptoms. She does, I don't have the energy I used to. I'm gaining weight, I don't want to. I feel funny, I, there's something wrong with me, doctor. Tell me what it is. And he says, fine, we'll do the tests. And she comes back later. And he says, well, I've got some good news for you. And she says, I don't want good news, I want to know what's wrong with me. 
I've got something wrong with me. If you can't tell me, I'll get another doctor. And he says, I've got some things to tell you. Maybe you don't expect. And she says, you can't tell me what's wrong with me. I'm leaving. And she leaves. Sitting on his desk is the piece of paper that shows that she's pregnant. <laughs> and that is, the, that is the same human spirit. God bless her. Born into a situation of three dimension where she is biased on what she thinks she's going to receive in a message. Because if she feels odd, then it's got to be bad news, isn't it? If she's gaining weight, it's got to be bad news. She's the one, by the way, who will then birth the child. And when the child comes out in all of its glory, she'll look at it and she'll say to it, You're what's wrong with me. And the karma will be established between them, and on it will go, and on it will go. So human being, I say to you that when you come to a place where the future is going to be discussed, what is the bias that you carry? Do you have the ability to understand what is being given? Will you give leeway and slack to those who go beyond the veil and come back and give you information? And would you understand it if they did. It's linear, you know. Your future, your past, your present, all you see is the strip, the road, one road. Cry and tell us the future, you say. And then if this channel doesn't give you the same message as another channel, you'll say, well, which one shall I believe? They both were channels, weren't they? What do you do about that? All right, I have another story for you. There once was a village. Next to this village, over the hill, an ocean. Now the villagers respected the ocean. Within the ocean they felt was God, for this was the sustenance, the water they knew somehow came over the mountain and gave them rain and grew the crops. God must be under the water, they said. In this village there were no lakes, there were no streams. The only thing they had ever seen very barely was that sacred thing called the ocean. It was over the hills. They didn't dare touch it because God was in the ocean, you see. And so along the way they sent the highest and best holy man they had and they said, we need you to go to the ocean. We need you actually to dip your body as far under the water as you can. And then tell us what God looks like. We need to know what is God. He was very afraid. He thought perhaps when he touched that body of water he'd vaporize. He'd never been in water such as the things were on this special village. He didn't even know he couldn't breathe underwater. He found out fast. <laughs> but he did his job and his faith and he said, Dear God, please forgive me if, if I'm doing something that is out of the permission of the sacredness and he made all the signs that he was supposed to make and then he did it. He got into the water and he dipped down as far as he dared realizing he could not breathe. This was a foreign place. He couldn't breathe. He, he, he couldn't stay down very long. It was murky there. He opened his eyes and he realized he was, he was submerged with sacredness and, and he was vibrating. He could barely, barely exist. He had to come up fast and he opened his eyes and behold a fish looking right at him. Oh, he said, there it is, there's God. <laughs> comes bursting out of the water, runs up the shore, crosses the mountains, comes back and he draws God for his village. It's a fish. And together they worship this fish. They finally know what God looks like. This is what's on the other side of the veil, they say, underneath the water where God lives. God is great. And the fish becomes for them, therefore, their symbol of worship. There's nothing wrong with that. But in 3D, they needed something, did they not? 
It would remind them of God, a symbol that they could take with them, put in their homes perhaps. Anything that reminds you of the divine is fine. They served it well. Until a younger holy man decided to cross the mountains. I want to see God for myself, he said. But I need the authorization of the rest of you. Indeed, the older holy man who had gone first says, go ahead. It's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. I hope you see God like I did. And he said, I will if, if God is there. He crossed the mountains. He went into the water. He went through the same thing the first holy man did. He held his breath. It was murky there. And he opened his eyes. And behold, he saw an octopus. That's very different than, than the fish. He goes and bursts out of the water, runs across the mountains, draws. He says, the first man is wrong. This is what God looks like. Oh, the village had no idea what to think about. Which one is right? They both went to the same place. They both looked under the water. And they both came back with two ideas firmly embedded in their mind of what God should look like. And they said, we cannot tell which one of you really is right. One of you is right, one of you is not. We know that is true. It's got to be one or the other. Which one is it? So they sent a third holy man to verify it. Under the water, he opens his eyes and he looks around and he sees an eel. <laughs> he comes back and says, they're both wrong. Here's the quandary. Three channelers, three psychics, three prophets, three seers. They both go to the other side of the veil and they bring back three kinds of information. They went to the same place and all of them saw something different, didn't they? And in that village there to this day is a quandary. What does God look like, you see? And the reason is because in their simplicity, they had made up their mind God was just like them. One thing. Therefore, when they reached the other side of the veil and took a look, they would see the one thing. And that's not what they got. So here we are already exposing a quandary that some humans have regarding those who would give you information that is beyond the veil, whether it is the future or even the way things are. One will not necessarily coordinate with the other. And you sit there as a one-track human being deciding which one is right when perhaps they're all right. Maybe the other side of the veil is filled with many things in many ways. While all along you're expecting to only see one. Here is the truth of it. On the other side of the veil there is no time. And so again we present this to you. In a way that hopefully a 3D human being could understand. You sit in the middle of a circle. Make it a table. Make this easy. You're in the middle of a table, a round table, and you're sitting in the middle and there are pieces of a puzzle all around you. And when you turn them over, some of them say future, some of them say past. All of them have energy. They all glow a certain way and there's colors to each of them. Now you've got to select which one you're going to look at. Which one you're going to take back to 3D and which one is appropriate for what is going to be manifested on that one track in the future. How do you know? That brings us to the next subject and we're going to call it human bias. The bias of a 3D human being, whether they're a master or whether they're not. And here is how I'm going to present this. This is important that you understand. I'm giving you the attributes of how to see the future. <laughs> Here is the human being who goes beyond the veil. He is not a master. In fact, he's very, very young and inexperienced at this. Oh, 
he could go there and he could spend time there and he could even see clearly. The new tools of this new energy have given him that ability and so there he is. And he's looking around. And he sees the freeway of life before him. The cars whiz by. The metaphor here is this, is this is life on earth. And he is immediately attracted, immediately attracted to the 15 car pileup. <laughs> oh, he sees the smoke. He sees the sorrow, the death, the destruction. He sees the fire. And he goes back and reports it. And he says, there's going to be a pileup. I don't know when, I don't know how, I just know it's just up the road. You better ready, you get, get ready and prepare. That is what is there. Here comes another human. Now he, he's a master. This human is a master. He has studied mastery, experienced in mastery. And for the first time, he goes across the veil. And he looks at the freeway of life. There it is again, same freeway. And then he sees it. Did you see what almost happened there, he said? If this, if this human being hadn't swerved left or, or right, there would have been a 15 car pileup. And he says, I am here to celebrate what didn't happen. Indeed, he said, you dodged that bullet. Indeed, let us celebrate life at its fullest. All of these people were saved. Praise God, he says. And he comes back and he says to his constituency, it's clear sailing ahead. I've just given you two human beings with opposite biases. One of them saw only the drama and brought back that. That's the human being who goes to the other side of the veil. He sees an angel holding two futures and he selects the one that smokes the most. <laughs> Drama. It's because the human being wants that in 3D. At some level, that's what you respond to. The master, the one who's experienced in seeing the beauty, sees what didn't happen and reports clear sailing ahead, you see. And you're in the same quandary, aren't you? Well, which one is right, you say? What are we going to do with this? So now I will tell you what the talent is required for a prophet, a seer, a teller of the future of the planet. It is not just mastery. It's not just being in tune with your DNA. It is carefully balanced over years of experience of going to the veil without a bias. I return with you to the table. And there you sit in the middle. And before you, you see all of the potentials of the planet, past and future. And you might say, how can you have a past potential? I'll tell you in a moment. Now, which one do you choose? Is it the one that unenlightened human being would choose that has the most drama and smokes the most? Or is it the one that the master chose, something that didn't even happen? It was a potential. It was a beautiful thing that might have manifested, didn't. Neither. In a certain way, you carry the energy of the earth, the 3D, with you under the water, if you wish with the choice to see the fish, the octopus, or the eel. The energy of the planet comes with you and you match the energy of the planet to whatever the energy is of all of the potentials before you. And this takes talent, experience, practice. It is not the human bias, it's the feeling of energy with energy. It is the feeling of what the earth brings to you as you submerge yourself to the other side of the veil so you can match it with the potential. And whichever potential feels like it matches the energy of the planet, choose that one and bring it back. And that is the one that you would present 
with this caveat. Here is what it is today. <laughs> you don't like that, do you? Crying, are you telling me the best prophets around can only give you what it is for today? Yes. Because tomorrow, dear humans, what if some of those in this audience woke up and sent light to a certain place? What if collectively you made a shift and a change that changed this planet dramatically? Because then tomorrow will be different than today, won't it? You see, because you're in charge. And I said this for 18 years. This is the message of crying. It always has been. It is no different, dear ones, than the master, world-class tarot reader. Think for a moment of the mechanics of what you know about tarot. It's designed as a science to vibrate with your energy and give you tools of direction. Even though the tarot reader may be the only one to touch the cards, you are sitting in front of him. It is your energy that is on the cards whether you touch them or not. Because the intelligence that is cosmic knows who you are, that you're there for direction. And uses his talent to sense your energy then to put the spread upon the table. It may seem random to you, it is not. And what then becomes what you would call the tarot spread is reflection of your energy. And it tells you about your potential for that day, for the future. It is no different. Simple, is it not? And yet difficult for 3D. Then we come to the concepts. Celebrating things that didn't happen. Oh. I'll give you the example. I want you to really listen carefully. For there are those in this room who are old enough to relate to what I'm going to tell you. 1945. 1989. Almost a half a century. You were on your way to the Armageddon, you know, an old energy, an old path, an old potential. Those were the days of the Cold War. And you faced off with two powerful countries, and one was the Soviet Union, who had taken over many other countries, who had built arsenals unto itself, who had a different philosophy, and who was at war in a cold fashion with this country, of where I speak right now. And those of you who survived that Cold War will remember the resources that were put into it. The fear that was put into it, the spies, the trickery, the death. Remember? Seemingly, two countries faced off with equal power. And then one of them shot a rocket into space. Obviously, it was ahead. Great fear. The missiles were bigger. Great fear. Oh, the resources that you put in to staving off that. Think about that. And the reason I talk to you about this is because this was the beginning of the buildup of what would become the Armageddon as prophesied in Scripture, as given by the priest Nostradamus. He saw it. Many saw it. Even the indigenous, some of them prophesied about what was going to take place in the year 2000 to 2001. When you had the harmonic convergence, you collectively decided that this would not happen on the planet. This was humans deciding at a spiritual level that something almost a half a century old involving two huge powerful countries would be dissolved. And within two years after the harmonic convergence, after you had made the decision, the Soviet Union fell over all by itself. It fell over because of the consciousness of the Russian people who would no longer support it by those who had given their energy, who said no more, no longer. 
the unthinkable. No prophet gave you that information because it was unthinkable. It was out of 3D. If somebody had told you that, would you laugh at them? Would you have told them they were crazy? It was, in your lifetime, the biggest thing that ever happened. Now, almost a half a century of of trouble and fear and worry erased. Okay, where is your monument? Shouldn't the earth got together at that point and built something? Shouldn't you have had long lines of appreciation, perhaps? The Armageddon that did not happen. The country that took control and solved the unsolvable. If you were not alive then, you don't know about the unsolvable. Called the, um, the evil empire, unsolvable, fell over all by itself almost overnight. Where's your monument? And you're saying, well, there, there isn't one. And I'll tell you why. Because human beings, you build monuments to the ends of wars and massive death and destruction. But when it comes to the things that didn't happen, you're moot. And you don't see them in the same way as the things that did. And so, dear ones, I am telling you that this is an adjustment you're going to have to make in your perception. I know who's here. So let me just pick out a few. About the traffic accident that you should have died in, you know who I'm talking to. How often do you celebrate the fact that you're still here? You think it was chance? You think it was a coincidence? That you walked away? I know who's here. You should have built a monument. And you should every day say thank you that I have made decisions in my life that changed the Akash. I want to tell you, dear human being, that there is no set time for your demise. Not one of you. Not known unto God. Only you know when you're going when you're gonna to check out. Only you know when it's over. That's how much control you have in your life. And I even mean to the degree you might say, well, I've got a, a disease. I didn't have anything to do with that. Oh, yes, you did. And you have all things to do with it, getting rid of it too. All the divinity in you, all the choices of life and death, they're all there, dear human being. Get used to this. You're in control, you always were, but in mastery, in this new energy, it's there for the taking. So, dear ones, are you going to celebrate the things that didn't happen? There are more than 20. <laughs> There are more than 20 in this room who had one set of death circumstances when they arrived on this planet. Not predestination, predisposition. When you may have checked out because of what you had planned for yourself when you got here that you circumvented because what you found while you were here changed it. Did you build a monument? Do you even know when it was? Some of you do. Some of you have had dreams about it. Some of you have narrowly escaped it and you know when those times were and you say, oh, I'm sure I'm glad I got through that. It's more than that. You should have built a monument. Now you're talking about the future and you want this entity to channel for you what's going to happen. And I'm telling you, you've even circumvented your own death. Potentials exist for all of you to remain a very long time on this planet because we are, we are in this situation collectively, all of us, on the other side of the veil and this side of the veil where your light is going to mean something so grand 
in this future of yours? Have you celebrated the things that didn't happen? Have you celebrated the diseases that you didn't catch? <laughs> the places that were not toxic? The criminals who never got to you? The houses that were never robbed? I am telling you that this lays in front of your table. Should have built a monument. That's what the future is and is not filled with potentials of what you would call positive and negative. And then we speak of the most difficult one of all. How can you change the past with what you do today? Well, in a linear 3D ribbon of road that you call past, present, and future, you can't. But in an interdimensional now, you do every day. Hard to have a metaphor of this one. But I've got one. I gave it to my partner even earlier. Consider for a moment, you are an author and you have written about many characters. You've developed their lives on paper. Maybe there's 12, 13, maybe more. And as a literalist and one who writes stories, you write about these, and that's the extent of it. Your shelves are filled with books about people and their lives. That wouldn't be uncommon, that wouldn't be unusual. Now let's say, from a greater place, a higher place of wisdom, you become a grand novelist. And suddenly, those 12 people interact together. In fact, they interact in a way that creates a hero, a story, and a victory. And it becomes still another novel. I ask you, what have you done? Have you changed who they were? No. But you changed the story, didn't you? Now suddenly take this metaphor and apply it to your past lives. Are they just there as individuals who lived on that ribbon of 3D? Or in the now, can you intertwine them together to create a story? Can you intertwine them together to create a victory and a hero, which is you in the chair today? And if you can do that, you've changed the past. Do you understand? In the now, suddenly it snaps into clarity. In the now, you've changed the very character of who you were that makes you now who you are. So the past had to change in order for the present to be manifest. Ah. And you want to know about the future. All right. 2007 the year of the nine. It is a year of potential for the nine does speak of completion. Remember the story of the woman who was pregnant and thought something was wrong with her? There are many who don't understand completion. Completion of what? Oh no, I'm gonna die. That means I'm, I'm completing my life, and that means I'm going to die. That's completion, isn't it, Cryon? So there'll be those who say, well, tell me what else is going to happen that's bad. <laughs> what if it was the completion of war? What if it was the completion of a thought that now comes together and gives you peace? Whether, what, if it's, what if it's a completion of strife in a romance and brings about peace in a family? What if it's a completion of those who would remove themselves finally from bad habits? What if it's a completion of your children on drugs? What if it's the completion of things that need to be completed? This is the year for it. 
And whereas you would ask me what's going to happen with your government and what's going to happen with those around you that you see on the news, I'm going to say look to yourself for what you do with you will determine the rest of the story. What needs to be completed? This is the year for it. The numerology will give you the energy tools they lay upon you as, as a, a posturing of help. 2007. Then what happens when you get a nine with a nine? September 2007. Cryon, is anything going to happen in September of 2007? Not today. <laughs> is there potential for something to happen in September of 2007? Yes. And you might look to this as being a beautiful thing. What if it was in the United Nations? A place where I've taken my partner over and over to celebrate what they have done. Not what they haven't done. To celebrate those who have, who have saved the children of villages because they gave them water and clean crops. And rid them of disease. To celebrate what happened, not what didn't happen. Look to 2007 as a year to wrap up things because of what's going to happen in 2008. <laughs> now I have spoken of this before. Great potentials of 2008. And as you lay the, all the potentials out on the table and you're sitting there, I'll tell you the ones on 2008 are glowing. They're glowing more for your energy than the ones on 2007. 2007 is like a utility year. <laughs> Accomplishment. Responsibility, all the things you don't want to hear. <laughs> to get you to the place of the year of the one. 2008 has the potential of new beginnings in a grand sense. And then there would be those who say, yeah, it's the beginning of the end. <laughs> and if that's where you want to go with it, then go there. Here's the potential. The beginning of what must be cleared for 2012. Four years remaining at that point. We stood on the stage in Tel Aviv. My partner was there. And I channeled in the chair the information to him that he needed to tell them. 2008 would be a year for Israel. This is still the potential. And what it means is the beginnings of a consciousness that would look there in the Middle East finally as the place of resolution between them and their neighbors in a way that will affect generations to come. Oh, you're not going to have Israelis and Palestinians loving each other in 2008. Oh, God works in slow ways, but what if the beginning was created so that two generations off they did, existed, and they could talk about the old energy like you now talk about an old world war. And the enemies you used to have, which you fought with tooth and nail, for your very survival and existence are your trading partners today. And you know how this can work. And it can work that way with the Israelis and the Palestinians and even the Iranians. So I want to ask you this. If you were of the generation of the Cold War, what did you think could not possibly happen? Because it happened, didn't it? And it happened without a war, and it happened without firing a shot. It happened in a way that had integrity over time, 
that was destined to be because your consciousness shifted and I'm telling you that is the promise of 2008 if it is in the energy of light that you will create from now to then so what if 2007 becomes the completion of old habits and the renewal of one's it will put you into a new paradigm on the planet. How many minutes a day do you send light to other places on this planet? You don't have a schedule? A schedule should be right next to that, that monument you built for things that didn't happen. Why do you think you're still here? Maybe you ought to reevaluate things. And if you're going to do that, I want you to reevaluate how much you are loved by this universe. The other side of the veil doesn't contain a fish, or an octopus, or an eel. <laughs> the other side of the veil is your family, who loves you dearly, and knows who you are. And you're working with that family to rearrange the energies of this planet. In this very room, we have those of you who send light daily, the, the working with the indigenous, working with the wisdom of the planet, working with the healing energies, with the crystals, we know who you are. Beautiful. And for those of you who are not, would you? Can you give us two minutes a day? If you can, and if all of you did it, oh, the power. Oh, the power. That's the message. That's the message. It's the message of crying will never change. You've come for a reason. You've changed the future of the planet. Now get to it. Because you're the ones. Listener, I want to include you right now. Out of time and place, it seems, you're on my table. I see you. I see you perched there. I see you listening to this message. You are all things to this planet. Your two ears, as you hear this message, as important as those who sit in front of me in what I call my now. But I see you too. Let this message resound and go to literally thousands who will give us two minutes. Less than one half of one percent of this earth has to awaken and do these things for you to have peace in the generations to come. For you, your children, your grandchildren, is it worth it? That's what consciousness can do. You've seen it. Things that didn't happen. Is it time? to celebrate them and say it is well with my soul bless those here bless those hearing and so it is <laughs>